our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad. As we begin today's Bible study. And as you invite somebody to join me. Let's humble ourselves in the presence of God and dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you. Yes, Lord. We are here for you, Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord. That you may have your way in us. Yes, Lord. Amplify your word. Yes, Lord. Reveal Jesus. Mm -hmm. Reveal the cross yes, and the love of God for the redemption of mankind. Yes, to you we give the praise, mm -hmm. the glory, yes, all the worship yes, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Today we will take our reading from the book of Romans. Chapter 1. From verse 1 to verse 7. And let's read. The Bible says, Paul, Paulo, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. In this wonderful book of Romans, we find the most comprehensive treatment of the gospel that can be found anywhere in scripture. In this book, Paul traces the building development of the gospel. From the condemnation of man to his glorification. From guilt to glory. In this book, Paul follows a logical argument. From the depth of the developed the depravity of humanity to the heights of divine grace. He reaches back to our eternity past and then takes us on a path to our eternity future. What we see in these beginning seven verses is so profound. It is not incidental. It's something that is fundamental to our spiritual life. Something which is not peripheral, but something that is primary. Something supreme to the spiritual life that we now live. And as he opens up 
this book in the seven verses that we just read which when you look at the Greek is just one sentence that has 176 words and here he gives us the seeds of the gospel of God like we saw last week he opened this up by introducing himself as Paul giving us his rank as the slave of Jesus Christ. He then gives us his office and he says he was called to be an apostle. And finally he gives us his mission. He said he was separated to the gospel of God. Now the word gospel is the word we so frequently use without getting its real meaning. From the Greek, it is the word eugenion where we draw the word good news. And it is here that he talks about the good news of God. And as we follow this, Paul says I'm separated to the gospel of God which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. What is Paul trying to point out here? He wants to show us that the gospel of God the good news is not a new invention. It is a message that is consistent with the whole of scripture. This message concerning the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, his sinless life, his substitutionary death, his bodily resurrection, his present enthronement in heaven, and his imminent return is not something that is new to us. It is not an invention that came after the fall of man. Jesus' coming was just a fulfillment of what God has previously set into motion. His death on the cross for our sins is according to the scriptures. When we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so everything Jesus did, everything he went through was in exact accordance to the Old Testament. It's not something new. It was it is not a surprise to God. Everything was done according to God's desire. According to how God had planned it. And when you read the scriptures, Jesus himself in John chapter 5 verse 39 when he was challenging the Jews he said you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me he bore testimony to this fact that the book from Genesis all the way through the prophets was concerning him. From the very beginning when men sinned through Adam God said in 
Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. No mukazi. He was speaking to the devil. And between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Why was God say, talking about here? God was talking about how the devil will be defeated. And through scriptures, we have more than 300 prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. Which gives us the assurance that if 300 scriptures prophecies have been all fulfilled, then everything else that God has spoken will surely come to pass. You see, everything that you read through the Bible, what you see are pictures, what you see are prophecies, or what you see are allegories, all pointing to the Messiah. Let me give you a few that are not so common to us. Consider at the beginning when the earth was without form. And the Bible says, and God spoke. So it is the spoken word of God that gave form to the earth. Consider Abraham. After he had come from rescuing Lot, he meets Melchizedek. A, a priest of Zalem. A picture of Jesus Christ. Again, we see a picture of Christ appearing in history. Consider Abraham. When he took Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice him as God had instructed him. And there God provided a ram on Mount Moriah. The ram which is the picture of Christ that God would finally bring to us. The Lamb of God who takes out the sins of God. Consider when the Jews were at entering into Jericho. And they sent in the spies. And the men of the city got to learn that they were there. Consider the scarlet cold that let them out. That also pointed to a picture of Christ. Oh, and then the big one, the serpent. The brazen serpent that Moses elected. And everyone that looked at this serpent that had been beaten by the snake. They were healed. Consider the manner that fell for 40 years. This also pointed to a picture of Christ. All the smiting rock that followed them everywhere they went and provided for their nourishment through all the 40 years of their journey. We can go on and on. But the message is this. All the law and the prophets pointed to Jesus Christ. No wonder in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus says, Think not 
that I came to destroy the Lord. All the prophets said, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The point, my friends and brothers, is that the gospel is not an out of afterthought. This gospel was planned before by, by God. And then, what is the gospel all about? Unless we lose what the real gospel is. In verse 3, Paul writes and says, Paul concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, yes, Christ, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Before we move on, let's expound on that. You see, what is happening here? It points out that this is concerning the person of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not about rules and regulations. The gospel is not about a set of rules that must be followed. The gospel concerns a person. Look at the birth of Jesus Christ. When the angel appeared to the shepherd, Matthew has that wonderful, Luke has that wonderful story. The angel does not say fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Listen to what he says. Great Tidings of great joy. He does not say fear not. I bring you good tidings. Because we have to send before you a set of rules and regulations. No, it doesn't say that. What does it say? He says, fear not. For behold, we bring you good tidings of great joy. Why? Because unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. The good tidings of great joy revolves around the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the focus of the good news. When we take Jesus Christ out of the good news, we have disemboweled Christianity. We have nothing left. The core and the heartbeat of the good news of the gospel of God that is given to us is the person of Jesus Christ. The whole gospel is found in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says concerning, and the Greek word there is the word peri, from where we get the word perimeter. So everything is limited to the boundaries of Jesus Christ. Jesus becomes the center of the gospel. And no wonder John tells us that he who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son does not have life. And why is that important? Because when we talk about the gospel, you can't alienate it, you can't separate Separated from the person of Jesus Christ. Now you ask me, who is Jesus Christ? Who is this Jesus Christ? When Paul describes him, he says concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here Paul brings to us four things. Number one, 
Nichisoka. He tells us that this Jesus, yes or no, first of all, is the Son of God. When he says Son of God, he is plainly putting it to us that one, he is divine. Secondly, that he is God. And within the Godhead, he is the second person of the Godhead. Now, when he talks about Jesus, what does this name mean? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when the angel comes to Joseph, and he says, you shall call his name Jesus concerning the Lord. And he says, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Jesus is the saving name. Jesus speaks to the mission. Jesus means God saves. All God is savior. So when you say Jesus, you're simply saying God is Savior. And then he says Christ. So Christ means the anointed one. Separated with a sign placed upon him. And the sign is the anointing. We see that in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. At his inauguration into public ministry. And the Bible goes on to tell us of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Who went about doing good? Healing of them that were oppressed of the devil. Because God was with him. God placed a mark upon him as the anointed one, as the redeemer of mankind, as our savior. Then finally, Paul uses the word Lord. This is the word kurios in Greek. Kurios means a ruler. A despot. A lord of all. It carries the sense of him not being able to be removed. What that speaks to is what we see in Philippians. Chapter 2 and verse 10. That is where we see the word curious come forward. Where Paul declares that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the word Lord there is the word curious. So here Paul uses the four words to describe the person of the gospel. He tells us, number one, he is the son of God. He is the one who became the savior. He is the chosen one or the anointed one. And number four, he is the Lord of our lives. Now, this is an amazing thought. Because Paul goes on to expand. And says, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, for God to become human, is something that almost ex- escapes our grasp. I, I, I one time happened to read a book by a certain man called C.W. Lewis. And in his attempt to bring this to our reasoning. He painted this picture. He said, consider that you had a dog. 
Katugambo ine mbwa. And this dog was in distress. Ngembwene erine bizibu byerimu. And for you, the only way to get this dog out of distress. Ngenkola yoka joso bolo kujembwa mu bizibu bwerimu. You had to leave your position. Osoka kuva mu kifocho. Stop being a man. Lekera okuba omuntu and become a dog. Ofuke mbwa in order for you to get that dog out of its distress. Do you know what that would mean for you? You'd have to leave your friends. You'd have to leave your current status. You had to leave your family. You had to leave everything you're familiar with right now. And become a dog. How many of us are willing to do that? The point here is, many of us, and I believe I'm one of them, I cannot. And it is not about can, I will not. Basically, let's put it to God and man. God became what man could not. And what man would not. No He left aside his majesty. He left aside everything that is glorious. And he put on flesh. He came to die. That is the message of the gospel. Christ was born. And suffered. And died. But that's not the end of the story. Because here we have the proof. That he rose again from the dead. And that was the declaration. That was the proof that heaven provided to us. That this was his son. You see, a dead Christ, Christo Murambo, a dead man is no good for us. Omuntu omufu tagasa. A dead Christ cannot save Christo, us from our sins. Christo omufu tasola tulo kolo kwa mbibia. A dead Christ cannot change us. Christo omufu tasola tuchu usa. The point is he did not just die. En songa nchite ya kuma kufa kwa He died. Yafa and rose again from the dead. He is alive today. So we worship a risen Savior. And that's why the Bible says who has declared and that is where we get the word, Greek word horizo. Horizo is where we get the word horizon. So if you looked out in the lake, you see where the sky and the sea meet. Or the water meet. That line is what we call the horizon. So this is a marked out zone. So when we say he was declared the son of God, it's like God draws the line. And the line was the resurrection. And it is only he who raised from the dead that he declared that this is my son. The book of Hebrews tells us that as many as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same. Why? So that through death he may destroy him who had power over death and free all those who through the fear of death were captives all the days of their life because of Jesus' resurrection we have been set free the sting of death has been removed. He is alive today. A story is told of a certain professor 
waliwo professor mu a liberal professor yali professor nga ye who was speaking to a team of students ngali ayogerele ekibinja kyaba kyaba igirizo and as he went on nganyumya he came up with so many quotes ya na yiye bigambe byenja we have to understand who liberals are te tsagotegere bana abantu bano these are people who don't believe the miraculous they don't believe the supernatural they don't believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead so as he went on and on quoting scholar after scholar within the room there was this one person who got out an apple and began munching on it. Nadjaye chibala natandiko chigaya. So the professor asked, uh, "Do you have a question?" Professor Nawuza sebo oyagala kubuza. And this man looked at him and said, "Yes, I have a question." Mwami namtume aga njagala kubuza. He said, "I have not read all the scholars you have read." Siso meba no bo nabo bo somet de biwajja mu ndigamba. But this is my question. Naye mbuza. This apple that I'm eating. Chichibala cha apple chendia. Is it sweet or sour? Goloza chiwoma oba chikawa and this professor said i don't know sir kubinga sebo simanyi because i have not eaten it i have not tasted it kubanga sinaba chiria and the, this gentleman said that's exactly the point omwami namugamba chino chenjagalo okutegeza neither have you tested my reason plus nawe tonaba kulega ku kristo wange eno yazukira what is the point today chicha isa we see the word keeps telling us is here to gambanga buli jo that jesus is not risen kristo te yazukira but i'm here to tell you today naye kutegeza olwalero that jesus christ is risen yes to kristo yazukira how do i know that manyira kuchi because he has changed my life David Akunze ya chuso bulamu And mwange. I stand before you today. Nyimirira maso golwa lero. It changed man. Omunte ya chuso Jesus is alive. Kubanga Yesu mulamu. So Jesus is alive. Yesu mulamu because he changed my life number one. Kubanga chisoka ya sokera kunze na chuso bulamu bwawe. But because also God says so. Nene chira katonda bwacho bwa yogera. So when we talk about the gospel we tuogera ku jidi it concerns a risen christ tuogera ku kristo yazukira it does not concern a rule and regulation tayogera ku mateka ga kufuga it concerns a, a god who became man bogera ku katonde yafuka omuntu and here he paul explains it to us as the seed of david paul anyonyola je tuli nti yali yava muzadde bya daudi and why is that important wachi chikuru because sin put an enmity between god and men hivi chateka obuchai wakati wafa abantu ne katonda so jesus had to be truly god yes ya inokubera katonda mu bujuvu in order to be able to stand in god's place aliyoka emirire mu chifo cha katonda but he also had to be truly man ate ya inokubera omuntu nga gwe so that he could stand in your position and that aje nga jira mu chifo cho nange and that is why he is able to be a mediator between god and men che chimufulo omutabaganya wakati wo omuntu ne katonda you see a mediator stands between two warring parties omutabaganya ya emirira makati ga abantu abakaya no ba abala two people who have fallen out with each other ngabantu babili bafuse balabe banabo so he makes reconciliation yajia okutabaganya on these both sides eri banababili and in order to be impartial he has to represent both sides kato okubuta bako side jagwira i know kugatta side okuchikirira bonna the only person who could do that omuntu yeke ali asobola echo is jesus christ babuita yesu christ right because by becoming man Boyafuko muntu the purpose was to die echigendwa che ikufa and by dying era mukufa because god cannot die katonda tafa so he had to put on flesh in order to die yayamba lo mubiri okugenderero okufa and then after death he rose from the dead ero kubanyuma ro kufa nazu kiri okuva mu bafu he knows everything divine amanyibuli chabwa katonda and he knows everything human era manyine chikwataganira kubanga and that's why paul tells us in first timothy 
Paul is about to come to Timothy, which is chapter two and verse five. So they are coming on your rock town, and he says there is one God, and one mediator between God and men. No matter what any of you are, what you are, the man Jesus Christ. Now you must say Jesus Christ. So Jesus, yes, then comes to do what we could not do. He comes to link us back to God. And that is the good news. The good news concerns the person. And the proof of the good news is the resurrection. Can we go to the provision? Having become man, and given us the good news. What does this good news provide? Verse 5 tells us, by whom, talking about Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. It tells us, number one, the first thing we receive is the grace. Now, grace is the unmerited favor of God. But I want you to see something here. Paul begins saying, by whom? Or through whom? Basically, what this means is like a channel. It's like a pipe through which something is flowing. So when he says by whom or through whom, he, he wants us to understand that through Jesus Christ, he is the channel through whom we receive grace. Now, grace is not something we work for. No, grace can only be received. Grace is not a reward to the righteous. No, grace is a gift for the guilty. Through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. May I say grace can only be received by an empty hand of faith. See, it is like what you are saying, I have nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I bring. Naked I come to be for grace. Helpless I come to be for grace. Grace is what God gives. To the guilty. She extends it to us because we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We don't work for it. God's grace is freely given. Why is it freely given? Because Jesus has purchased that grace for us. And this grace extends to every aspect of grace. I, I know theologians have broken it up into saving grace, sustaining grace, sanctifying grace, strengthening grace, serving grace. All the graces. Paul 
proceed from Jesus Christ. No wonder John tells us in John chapter 1 verse 16. Why he says of his fullness. Have we all received. Have we all received. Not some of us. Not a chosen few. Not those from a particular background. Not those of a particular race. But of his fullness. Talking about Jesus Christ. Have we all received grace upon grace? It is one grace upon another. It is grace in unexpected places. It is favor when you don't expect it. It is when you have received one grace and another grace follows. It is a flood upon our lives. That God is multiplying grace to us. This talks or speaks about an overflow of abundance of something you have not worked for. Of something you don't qualify for. And we obtain all this through Jesus Christ. This is what he gives us as a reason of when we receive what he died for us to achieve. In verse 6, he goes on to say, Among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Basically, what he's saying to us that we have a belonging. We belong to Jesus Christ. We are not forsaken. We are not rejected. We have a belonging. We belong to Jesus Christ. Who is the Son of God. So Jesus introduces us to God as Father. And then the Bible then is fulfilled that as many as received him. Then he, he gave the exousia. The power to become the children of God. How does that happen? It happens because through grace, you and I are called of Jesus Christ. And Paul then says to all who are in Rome, Beloved of God, let me explain this to you. It's not just saying, it doesn't end with you being saved. It doesn't end with you belonging to Christ Jesus. It changes how God perceives you. Now God perceives you as his beloved. We receive God's grace. But we also receive a new description. We now belong to Jesus Christ. And we are called the beloved of God. And Paul goes on to say, it doesn't stop at beloved. This is grace upon grace. Now you're called beloved. And he says, you are called saints. Now saints are those that are set apart from the world. It is God saying, you are special to me. And you don't just receive grace. But you are also a recipient of his peace. The peace which the world cannot take away. The peace which Jesus says, my peace I give to you. The peace which only divine 
lion can provide that has been given to you that has been bestowed to you because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior a story is told about a man who passed on and he had a collection of wonderful art. And in his will, he said his collection of art pieces will be auctioned. So everybody gathered to be able to buy these wonderful pieces of art. In his will, the first piece was a, a very ordinary piece of art. Which was a picture of his son that had died. So he said, this has to be auctioned first. So as they began to auction, the people were not interested because it was ordinary. They wanted to get this out of the way so that they can buy the more exquisite pieces. Within the, con- within the people gathered was an old man who said, I don't have much. But I love this son. So, can you Sell me this piece for this money. So he gave him the money and bought the piece. And the people were happy. Because now they would buy the expensive pieces. And the auctioneer said, wait a minute. This is the second part of the wheel. He had declared whoever bids for this painting of his son gets all the paintings. And basically what the message was, he who has the son has it all. See, that's the same thing with our relationship with God. The only difference is we don't pay anything. You just place your faith in Jesus Christ and receive by grace. And once you do that, you belong to God. You are the beloved of God. You are graced by God. You are given His peace. And it does not end there. After the blessing. The Bible says you receive apostleship. The word apostle, apostleship is the word apostolic. Which we understand means to be sent on a mission. What is Paul saying here? In verse 1, he began by saying, Paul, a servant, concerning himself. He says, I, Paul, a servant. Now he comes to verse 5. He says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. What is he saying here? He's moving from I to a we. It is not he alone that is the ambassador of the gospel of grace. He says all of us are ambassadors. By whom? Concerning Jesus Christ. 
Kuyesu Kristo Lord. We are now ambassadors. Nafe tufu seba baka. You and I are called to be the salt of this earth. Wenange twaiti batfuke munyo. You and I then become the light of this world. Wenange femu sana gwansi. And these cuts across all nations. Era chino chiri buli mawanga. These cuts across. Chino chiyingira wonna. The result of our apostleship. Ebyava mu kutume bwa places a sense of mission on our lives. Chitu wente gero you are a person on assignment. And Paul goes on to say, for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. What is Paul trying to say here? He talks about obedience to the faith among all nations. He's trying to tell us that this calling is universal. All nations is the word ethnos. Now ethnos is where we get groups of people. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is is not just a few people. It is to all nations. Among all nations. Among all tribes. As you go about the gospel mission of your apostleship. Where does it end? All nations. People of all tribes, tongue and tribe, come to the obedience of the faith. And that is also very critical. Because it is Jesus' command to us to go make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in his name. Teaching them to observe all things that he has commanded. There are keywords there that we need to pick from there. He says, teach them to obey all things that I have commanded you. We need to understand that when we come to the faith, we begin a journey of obedience. You see, the church should be known not by brilliant auditorium. Although brilliant auditoriums is good to have. We are not called to be known by which choir sings best. Although we need to have choirs that sing well. We are not known to be known by good church attendance. We are called to be obedient to the faith. That's what Paul commends the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 26 he says but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. You see, if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you really have a thriving relationship with him, this needs to be marked by obedience. It needs to be marked by growth. If you are not growing in your work of faith, it is not because you are not in the right environment. No. It is because you are not obedient to the faith. You, you see, if the reason why you are not thriving is because you are dead. 
Diori Mufu, if you are alive and living, and you are in the right environment where the Holy Spirit dwells, and the seed of the Word of God is there, you have only and only one way to go, and that is to thrive. And that is to grow. So if you're not growing, if you're not thriving, Stop finger pointing. Allow the Holy Spirit to search you. You are dead. The dead don't live. They don't grow. So let me ask you the question. How have you received this gospel? Have you received this gospel? Has your life for the last five, ten years, fifteen years of your life been grown. What do you love it, you see, it is the life of obedience that marks out a believer. It is the life of obedience that God is looking out for. If you have never believed the Lord Jesus Christ, today I am extending this good news to you. We come on behalf of the king as his ambassador to you the sinner who says come to me all you that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest today Jesus is saying if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink will you come if you have never given your life to Jesus, this is your moment. Surrender to Him. Allow the life of God to move the dead in your life. He who has the Son has life. Let's pray. Says, Father in heaven. I believe you are the savior of the world. And I am a sinner. Dead in my sin. For the wages of my sin is death. But you gave the gift to mankind. Which you declared by raising him from the dead. And that gift is Jesus Christ. They are to be received by grace. Today, I invite you, Jesus, in my life as my Lord and personal Savior. Save me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Create in me a clean heart. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you as an enemy of this gospel to the rest of the world that my life will testify of your grace of your love of your goodness and of your faithfulness thank you Lord for saying Amen now if you have said this prayer God has come in your life and said there is that number on your screen, please call it. And you will be given the first steps into this wonderful journey of faith. For you that is already a believer in Jesus Christ, understand you have received the apostleship. You are on a mission to spread the good news. This is news about the person of Jesus Christ. This is news that has proof concerning the resurrection. This is news that has provision 
Then I'm only a Gajanova God gives you the grace. May you be an able minister of the gospel. And take it across to all creation. And God bless you as you do that. Therefore, from Dominion Church, it has been a pleasure to have you this evening. We say until we meet again, God richly bless you. Shalom.